Well, um, it, it feels like I've been out for a month, but it was just one week. Um, today we start a new series that we've titled Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I know, I know, I know what you're thinking because this is what you're thinking. If you could only pay attention to me as you were paying attention to that movie, my goodness. <laughs> Well, for those of you who haven't watched it, that classic from 1981, I would not spoil the end. But uh, today we'll talk about the saddest story of one of the saddest stories in the history of Israel. And to set the background, we'd like to, to go back to the Old Testament. Because see, this ark that Moses built directed by God was the symbol of the presence of God with his people. And they knew that every time that they came to the presence of God, God spoke to them. They knew that it was God who gave them victory in battle. They knew that it was God who led them and guided them and protected them. But one of the things that happened was that they began to trust on this ark, not as a symbol of the presence of God, but they begin to trust on this ark as if it was a token of good luck. So one day they took it into battle against the Philistines. The Philistines were the, 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 the nemesis, the, the enemy number one of Israel. And they went into battle against them. And what happened was that they took the ark into the battlefield. And First book of Samuel tells us in chapter 4, verse 10, what happened. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and they fled, every man to his home, and there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell, and the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. What happened to the ark? Was captured. So the ark was no longer in the camp of Israel. The ark was no longer in the sanctuary. The ark was taken by the Philistines. So now there is a problem. Because they lost sense of the reality of the symbol of the presence of God. It used, and used it in the wrong way. They lost the presence of God in the camp. Verse 10 tells us, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it beside Dagon. Dagon was the king, I mean the, the god of, of the Philistines. And this is what happened. It was a very common practice that when an army and, 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 uh, 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 came to conquer another army, the, the winning would go to the most sacred place of the loser and would take the most sacred item. And they would take it to the temple of the most sacred god. This is not unique in the story of the Bible. This happened in the time of Daniel. If you remember the story in chapter 1 of Daniel, the Babylonians came to Israel, they conquered Judah, and they took the instruments that were in the, in the sanctuary, and they took it back to their temple in Babylon. So this was a common practice. But what, that, what they did not expect was what happened after. In chapter 5, I will not show you, I'll just tell you real quick. It says that when they came to the, to the, to the ark, weird things happen. Because they put it in the temple of their God. And when they come to check it out, they found their God face forward on the ground in front of the ark. So they said, okay, something, did anybody feel the earthquake last night? Uh, what happened? So they lift them up, they put them back together, and they went home. The next day they come back and now they, not, they just found God on the ground, but they found it headless. And the head was right next to the ark. So they said, okay, something is wrong here. <laughs> something is wrong with this picture. So they try to fix it together and the next day everybody in the town got tumors. So they said, okay, okay, let's see, what's the common denominator here? Since we brought the ark of the Israelites here, weird things are happening. We got to take it back. And that's exactly what they did. So what they did is that they took the ark and they put it in, on a cart and they sent it back hauled by two cows. But it didn't come all the way to the capital city. It stayed in the province. So now David, 
says in, in chapter 13 of 1 Chronicles, Assemble all Israel from the Nile of Egypt to Libo Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kiriath Jerim. Now David, David is the original raider of the lost ark. But this is the challenge for today. David had all the greatest intentions in the world. David wanted to do what any other Israelite king would do. Try to recover the ark of God into camp. But this is the thing. Things didn't pan out the way that David expected. Because oftentimes, in fact, most of the time, intentions, good intentions, don't always count. So go to your notes. And let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. And that's where we start the message today. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. So it says, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel. 30,000. How many? 30, How many Israelites died when they lost the ark? 30,000. 30, so David is doing something really special here. He's saying, okay, let's plan this the right way. This 30,000 men will be a symbol that Israel is not fallen. These 30,000 people of Israel will represent our hope, our presence, our existence, that we are alive, that we're well, and we're going to recover the ark. Now, another reason why he took 30,000 is because he didn't expect, he, he didn't know what to expect. Because, see, the Philistines were tricky. And he said, okay, the ark is there, but we don't know if they're planning to attack. It might be an ambush. So what we're going to do is that we're going to be ready with 30,000 men. Verse 2, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Valley Judah to bring up from the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. Upon this, uh, up to this moment, everything looked great. The plan was right. The ark was at hand. It was reachable. The, the, the emotions were perfect. Everybody was ready to celebrate the recovery of the ark. But there was a lesson to be learned. Good intentions aren't always enough. Only good intentions don't really count. David needed to learn that it's not just about the desire to do something right or something good. Even something that would benefit someone else. But it has to be according to what God will is about. Verse 3. And then they carry the ark of God on a new cart. How did they carry it? On a new cart. And brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. This is what we can call a good faith mistake. Have you ever made one of those? A good faith mistake. See, back in ancient times, people believed that the earth was the center of our planetary system. This is called geocentrism. If you remember history, there was a man by the name of Galileo, Galilei. And he was the first one to say that the earth was not the center of the planetary system. In fact, the church wanted to kill him because he was saying that the earth was not the center. <laughs> now we know a little bit better. But at the time, it was a good faith mistake because that's all they knew. Have you ever been to a barber shop? Anybody? Never. Ladies? <laughs> Anybody? Now, barber shops. Now, barbershops are really interesting because if you know a little bit of the history of barbershops, they come from a medical background. See, back in the day, 
in the, last, uh, in the 1800s, people believed that diseases were the cause of bad blood, which is not too bad of an idea, except that the treatment was very bad. And they had this process that they call bleedings. And so what they thought was that if you were sick, you had to go to the surgeon so that he could perform a bleeding. So they had these different kinds of knives that they would poke you on the back with so you could bleed a little and the bad blood would come out. Now, I, I'm still thinking and trying to imagine how did they know where to poke where the bad blood was from the body, but that's what they practiced. Now, this belief was so well accepted that George Washington, the first president of this country, died in the bleeding. So now you're still asking right now, why is the barber shop there? Because see, back in those days, that was not the 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 the, the bar of a, uh, the column of a barber shop like it is today. It was an actual arm with bandages and the streaks of blood from the bleeding. So that's how they knew that was the place where the surgeon was operating that day. People die like George Washington at the barber shop. But it was good faith mistake. Because people thought that that was the right thing to do. Today we make a lot of good faith mistakes because we don't know any better. David committed a good faith mistake. He wanted to do something good. He wanted to do something right. But unfortunately, he made a mistake. Let me ask you again. How were they carrying the ark back to Israel? On a new cart. Now, where does this idea come from? Into David's head. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7, Now then, take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke and yoke the cows to the cart, but take their calves home away from them. If we read the text just right there, we say, okay, God is saying this is how you have to transport the ark, right? Wrong. Because this is the way the Philistines carry the ark to their home. So now we have a problem right there in verse 4. You have it in your notes. So the sons of Abinadab, these are the sons of the high priest. These are the people who should have known the scriptures. These are the people who have the manual from God how to make, how to, how to make, how to transport, how to deal with the ark. These are not newbies. These are not people who didn't know anything. These are people who were supposed to have done their homework about the transportation of this so important piece of God's experience with his people. And it says in verse 4, the sons of Abinadam were driving the new cart with the ark of God. We try to do good at times. We try to do something nice. We try to do what seems to be correct. But things turn out bad. Has that happened to you? We try to change a habit, and we pick up a worse habit. Let me give you an example. Since today is health day in the afternoon. We try to stop eating meat, but we pick up a bad habit. We, all we eat is vegetarian meat. And now you're telling me, you're asking, Pastor, what's wrong with that? Everything is wrong with it. It's processed. It has tons of sodium. It was intended, let me tell you, let me quote, let me quote John Harvey Kellogg, the inventor of vegetarian meat. He said, vegetarian meat was designed and only intended to be transitional food between those who eat meat into vegetables. Wow. And let the sermon end right there. <laughs> we try to fix a relationship. And instead of fixing it, we make it worse. We have to learn a lesson that to succeed isn't about doing what is necessary, but to do what is right. What is it that David needed to do that was right? Verse 5. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. So they, they have the, the ark and the card. The sons of Abinadab are, are 
got in the car. They're, they're cheering because the ark is coming home. They're celebrating. Everybody is singing and playing their instruments. They're enjoying life because the ark is coming back. It says right there, they were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So they had the whole orchestra accompanying the ark back home. Verse 6. And this is when the story gets interesting. <laughs> and when they came to the threshing floor of Nacor, we would call it a speed bump. Uza realized that the ark tilt over. And he did exactly what any warm-blooded Israelite would do to protect the ark. It says right there, put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. For the oxen that were pulling the cart stumbled. I mean, let's be honest. You would have done the same thing. Oh, I need to hold it. Uza meant well. He tried to do something good. The problem was that even though it was necessary, it wasn't the right thing to do. It wasn't the strong, instructed thing to do. It wasn't in the will of God to do. Patriots and Prophets tells us about this story. The Philistines who had no knowledge of God's law had placed the ark upon a cart when they returned it to Israel. And the Lord accepted the effort which they made. Why did God accept that effort? Because they didn't know better. Now, but the Israelites had in their hands a plain statement of the will of God. In all these matters and their neglect of these instructions was dishonoring to God. Upon Uzzah rested the greater guilt of presumption. So doing what's necessary is not always good. Because what we have to do is not what's necessary. It's what is right. And what is right is what is according to the will of God. Verse 7. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God has struck him down there because of his error. So he touched the ark, and bzz, he died right there. He died there beside the ark of God. So now let's, let's switch the camera, and let's focus on David. David is ahead of the parade, celebrating. And as he's going and singing and, and playing his harp, probably, all of a sudden there's silence behind him. And the silence was caused by a, oh, from the crowd that was near, near to Uzzah. David asks, what happened? He turns back. And the ark is right there in the cart. And Uzzah is on the ground. The sons of Abiatar tell David, King, the ark was about to fall. Uzzah reached out to, to hold it. He touched the ark and he died. Verse 8. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. Now let me read that again to see if you, if you, if you catch it. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. Did you get it? Okay, let me help you. It's a question. Is David angry against God? Okay, that means you didn't catch it. Look. David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. David is angry because Uzzah died. The Lord caused Uzzah to die, but he's not angry against the Lord. He's angry because that happened. Are you with me? David is angry because he's saying, it's my fault. 
I didn't do my homework. And perhaps in the back of his head, when he heard what happened and he's mad, he's remembering the stories and he's remembering the scriptures that there was a specific, specific process to carry the ark from place to place. David was not angry against God. He's angry with himself. He's angry because a, an innocent man who meant well died and is all under his care. Exodus 37, 1, it's right there in your notes, says, Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half was its length. And a cubit and a half, it was its breadth. And a cubit and a half is height. Verse 4. And he made poles. You know what poles are? Sticks. Of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. Remember the movie? Indiana Jones did it right. <laughs> he used the poles through the rings to lift the ark. So David is remembering this text and he is mad. He's angry. He's upset because he forgot that simple thing. That cost a man his life. We do things without knowing why. We do things maybe because the last time we saw those things being done, someone did it like that. In fact, we do things over the years just because they're always being done like that. I was uh, preaching in the south of Mexico and a couple of, a few years ago actually. And it was, I was preaching in the south of a state called Veracruz, very close to Tabasco, which is a very, very, very humid area. So I was preaching in two churches, one at five in the afternoon, another one at seven. And the whole day was very, very hot and humid. In fact, I took like 10 showers a day. And it seemed like every time I took a shower, when I dried off, as soon as I removed the towel, I was wet again. So... One of those nights, I'm preaching, and I, I, you know, I, I move my hands. And when I moved my hand, I was speaking like this, and I saw a drop of sweat dropping from my wrist all the way to the ground. <laughs> That's how humid it was. So, Sabbath morning, I went to preach in one of the churches. And when I was sitting in the room where we were preparing to, to go, we'll call it the pastor's office. A young man came and went to a little closet. And in this closet, there were a couple of hangers with tons of ties on them. And he went and grabbed one tie and put it on. And I'm thinking, if you're not wearing a tie, why do you want to wear one now when it's 120 degrees and 100% humidity? So you know me, ask him, hey, why are you wearing the tie? And he said, well, because I'm going to the presence of God. And that made me think. That made me think. If you don't have a tie, you can't be in the presence of God. But, but let me explain something before you start looking at me weird or weirder than what you're already looking at me. You see, I'm wearing a tie. And I'm wearing it because I love you. <laughs> but this is what I think about ties. The tie does not cover me up. Does not warm me up. It is just, we have a name for those pieces of garment. It's just an accessory and that's exactly when my when my close minds comes into place because if I need an accessory of clothing to be in the presence of God I have a problem because my God is more into fashion than into the people's heart 
And see, in some places, we made it so difficult, so tough, so religious, that if you don't have a tie, you can come into the presence of God even though it's 200 degrees. And see, one of the things that, we, that happens to us is that we do things oftentimes without thinking just because in the past it's been done like that. So when we don't know what's, why something is done and we continue to do it, it becomes a tradition. And once a tradition becomes part of my religion, it causes death. Let's look at the Middle Ages for, for a little bit. Tradition caused death in religion. And those who wanted to follow God the right way. So we have to be very careful on how we do things and the way we do things. And we always have to ask a question, why do I do this? Because the moment that we don't have that answer, we're doing it wrong. David was trying to do something that had already been done before. The ark carried on a cart. But he forgot to ask the question, why do we do this? Why did they do this? Is there another way that should be done that is better? Is, is there another way that God would accept even more? Is there another way that God is instructed? Because you know what? When we make good choices, are always followed by blessings. Good choices are always followed by blessings. And see, life is weird because life is full of all the decisions that we make. Think about this for a second. The night before you wake up in the morning, you decide at what time you're going to wake up the next day. Because we set up alarm uh, 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 our alarm clock. Or not even that anymore, we just go to our phone. And even our phones have this thing that when the alarm goes off, we, oh, just five more minutes, and we snooze it. So because we snoozed it four or five times, we get up in a rush because, oh, I'm late now. So now you have to make a decision. Do I take a shower or not? <laughs> and, and, and because you're half-dressed going to the kitchen to see what you can eat for breakfast... You put a bagel in your mouth while you're putting your pants on, and then you're going in your car, and, and, and you're going to work, and you're already late. So now in front of you, there is a yellow light, and you have to make a choice. <laughs> do I step on it, or do I stop? And you said, ah, I just watched Fast and the Furious. I'll step on it. And you run that yellow light, but right when you're about to cross the street, the light turns red. And you pass it. You look around and you don't see anything because you didn't see the cop that was stopped on the other side. <laughs> and now the next thing that happens is that you have the happy car with the beautiful lights behind you. <laughs> and a well-dressed man in a tie <laughs> coming to ask you a question. Do you know why? Are you with me? Experienced, huh? <laughs> Do you know why I stopped you? <laughs> I have, have the biggest idea, officer. <laughs> but see, all the decisions that we make, all the choices that we make, will carry consequences. If we make, like the story said, if we make good choices, the consequences will be good. On the other hand, when our choices are poorly made, ill-advised, without purpose, so will be the consequences. Verse 9. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? How can we bring the ark home safely? How can we do, we do, how can we do this right? So what is David doing? What is David saying? 
We have to go back to the drawing board and we have to do our homework. Verse 10. So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. David said, no, this cannot happen again. We have to stop right now. Whatever we are, we have to stop. We cannot continue because we are not doing it right. We have to change the way. We don't know how yet. We don't know when we're going to do it, but we have to do it right. So the way we're doing it is wrong and we have to stop. What David wanted from the get-go was to have the blessing of God on his people. He didn't want suffering. He didn't want pain for his people. But he was not doing it right. So he had the will and the strength to stop it. And it says right there in the second part of verse 10, But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, to the Gittite, and the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. How long? And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. At times, we want our blessings to come quickly. We want the good things to happen now. God, I've been praying for this. Why aren't you answering? Perhaps because there's something that you have to learn. There was a time when a, when a young executive went to work at this big fancy business firm. And when he got there, he wanted to, to learn the right ways. He wanted to learn from the experienced executives. So he went to the most experienced executive officer in that firm. And he asked him, Lord, I mean, Lord, sir, almost, right? <laughs> sir, can I ask a question? And he said to the young man, yeah, sure, ask. How can I be successful in business? And the old experienced man responded to the young executive, well, you have to make bad choices and the young executive said wait 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 but how can I do bad choices and he said well you need experience and now the young man asked well how can I get experience and he said well making bad choices and I think that we've all have experienced bad choices. And we have such a loving God that He's waiting to bless us even in spite of our bad choices. He knows our imperfections. He knows our deficiencies. He knows our tendencies. And He knows that we're bound to make bad choices. And that is where the grace and the mercy of a loving God who is the only one worthy because He is the true Lamb. He's willing to forgive us when we realize that what we're doing is wrong and we need to change. And just like David, at that moment when he made that mistake, he stopped to learn, to grow. It is my prayer that for all of us, when we are making those by choices, when we realize that what we did is wrong, that we stop and ask God, God, what is it that I need to change? What is it that, that, that needs to be transformed in my life? What is the thing that I need to be right so I can receive your blessing? Help me to do the choice that I need to make.